Harriet Tubman is the most famous leader of the Underground Railroad. But few know that John Brown is also part of the same organization of abolitionists, helping escaped slaves gain their freedom. And while Brown's violent ways alienate many white abolitionists, his commitment to eradicate slavery impresses Tubman and other black leaders of the movement. We can set up a stronghold here, in the Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Like John Brown, Tubman stands in defiance of the atrocities of slavery. Neither one can sit idly by and do nothing as innocents suffer abuse, willing to put themselves in harm's way to stop it. When Harriet Tubman was about 13 years old, the plantation cook came to her and said, you need to come to the dry goods store with me. Who gave you permission to leave your work? My, my work was done. The more you fight, the more lashes you get. And the young man was trying to escape, and the overseer yelled to her to stop the young man, but she didn't. She stepped away from the door and let the young man run out. An overseer threw a lead weight and hit her in the forehead and literally pushed in a part of her skull. As a result, she was subject to what we now think was a temporal lobe epilepsy, which would give her these stunningly realistic premonitory visions. And Harriet had a vision of an older looking man with a long beard. And he's trying to say something to her. When we take the arm, 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 the oppressed thing, all of us, rise up, cast off, shadows, enjoy us. And before she can understand what he's saying, a group of men with clubs come and battered him to death. A number of years go by, and John Brown arrives at Harriet Tubman's homestead, and she recognizes him immediately because he was the man she saw in her vision. And so she knows this is somebody she should listen to. And it is to Harriet, among the first people, that Brown reveals his plan for this armed slave insurrection. From the shadows to the spotlight, the issue of slavery dominates the national conversation. In Illinois, Democratic Senator Stephen Douglas defends his seat against an obscure anti-slavery Republican. The campaign hinges on a court ruling that denies equal rights to a freed slave. The Republicans assert the Dred Scott decision to be monstrous because it denies that the Negro is or can be a citizen under the Constitution. I do not approve of Negro citizenship in any and every form. Abraham Lincoln has a very complicated relationship to the institution of slavery. We wouldn't call him a radical abolitionist by any stretch of the imagination. We would call him perhaps a gradualist. I have no purpose to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. But there is no reason in the world why the Negro is not entitled to all the natural rights in the Declaration of Independence, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He is my equal. He is the equal of Judge Douglas and of every living man. Lincoln has a way of expressing these things with a clarity that is notable to his contemporaries. And he's the one who steps up and says, I'll stand for the Senate in opposition to Douglas. Lincoln is unable to unseat Douglas, and the Democrats maintain a strong pro-slavery presence in Congress. 
Convinced that slavery can only be eliminated by force, John Brown takes the fight into the South. With these, we shall end the curse of slavery forever. Brown has been planning some sort of guerrilla action that involves freeing slaves. I think he wants to provide all of the weapons necessary to supply his army. So what better a place to ignite that spark than the federal armory at Harper's Ferry, then establishing armed outposts from which guerrilla raids could take place on a constant basis. God is on our side. So he's going to send out his men. They're going to liberate the slaves, give them guns. Then those slaves are going to go out, and then they're going to take over more plantations and get more slaves with guns. He's going to build this sizable army, and then they're going to march into the South armed to the teeth. I've come here to free every last slave in the state. Despite his best laid plans, John Brown's revolution meets strong opposition, and his secret raid turns into a life or death standoff. Barricade the door! The door. Remember, remember what you're fighting for! I've come here to free every last slave in the state. The armory at Harper's Ferry, Virginia, is taken over by John Brown and his force of abolitionists. It's an act of aggression on federal property, highlighted by the taking of a valuable and symbolic hostage. I'll teach you to show some respect. That's enough, Blanton. We must endeavor to elevate these inferior creatures. Whoa! What? Get the sword. Welcome, Colonel Washington. George Washington's sword. Your name holds great value, Colonel. John Brown takes the great grandnephew of George Washington hostage for the value of his name and ancestry. He also confiscates a sword that belonged to the first president. Now, some historians believe that these symbolic gestures are Brown's attempt to connect the liberation of slaves to the Declaration of Independence. And in doing so, Brown believes he's fulfilling the promises our founding fathers would not. You might as well put a noose around your neck yourself. You are a slave, and you make him a man. If the citizens interfere with me, I will burn the town and have blood. John Brown fails to rally the slave population to revolt, but he does manage to get the attention of the local militia. Here they come! So as news kind of filters out that there's this group who have captured this arsenal, this feeds into the greatest nightmare of your typical Southerner, which is the slave insurrection. For example, Matt Turner's rebellion from 1831, you had a slave leading his fellow slaves and sacking plantations and killing masters and overseers. That was something that did wind up feeding a paranoia. And so there was this panic.
exaggerated accounts of the raid at Harper's Ferry quickly reached the White House. 700 armed slaves at Harper's Ferry? I don't have to tell you what danger we're in, Colonel. President Buchanan sends the closest man at hand, a pro-slavery officer with deep roots in Virginia and personal ties to Harper's Ferry. Robert E. Lee is actually on leave from the Army when all of a sudden news comes in that you have this raid in Harper's Ferry. Robert E. Lee's around. OK, let's get him to do it. Take the Marines from the Naval Yard. Put an end to this. Yes, Mr. President. Gunned and outnumbered, Brown's last resort is a truce, sending Aaron Stevens and his own son Watson to negotiate. Watson. Stevens. Take this. Tell them we will trade the hostages for our safe passage out of here. him surrender terms. Yes, sir. If you surrender now, your lives will be spared. It is to be an unconditional surrender. There shall be no surrender. We have but one life to live and once to die. But if we lose our lives, it will perhaps do more for our cause than our life would in any other way. Stop your moaning, Watson. Die like a man. God is on our side, men. Remember that. We are God's weapon. caught people by surprise. It was so audacious, it was so daring, and yet it was so badly planned that it was doomed to failure from the beginning. But it was the kind of thing that convinces many white Southerners that abolitionists are willing to embrace violence as the way to end slavery, and that they need to protect themselves, and if need be, to leave the Union in order to do that. John Brown's mission fails to spark a rebellion. But the raid at Harper's Ferry sends a bloody message to Southern interests. The days of slavery are numbered. Politicians, abolitionists, and soldiers clash over slavery. And as both sides grow more entrenched in their convictions, John Brown sends a jolt through a divided nation. Brown represents the slaveholder's greatest fear, 
he's a violent reminder of the increasing threat to their southern way of life. quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away, but with blood. Southern hysteria over John Brown is so great that to prevent a possible rescue, only soldiers attend his hanging. Among them are Major Thomas J. Jackson, who will come to be known as Stonewall, and John Wilkes Booth, whose morbid curiosity drives him to steal a uniform to witness the execution. The fierce young actor hates what Brown stands for, but oddly enough, finds common ground with a man who is willing to kill and die for what he believes. God bless Virginia! John Brown's raid really bolsters the secessionist movement tremendously. There were some who saw this as the logical outgrowth of a Republican agitation on the issue of slavery that would lead to violence. For Southerners, John Brown is just the tip of the anti-slavery spear. The true threat is the growing Republican Party, exemplified by long-shot presidential candidate Abraham Lincoln. You charge that we stir up insurrections among your slaves. But John Brown was no Republican, and you have failed to implicate a single Republican in his Harper's Ferry enterprise. So neither let us be slandered from our duty by false accusations against us. But let us have faith that right makes might. And in that faith, let us dare to do our duty as we understand it. And it is within this speech that he kind of marries the pragmatic argument of preventing the extension of slavery with the moral argument that there is a problem with slavery morally and that it is damaging the credibility and the unity of the United States. The speech makes Lincoln a national political star, and he capitalizes on his newfound fame to become the Republican Party's nominee for president. Though the North embraces Lincoln, Southern states refuse to even put him on the ballot. Running against a divided field of Democrats, including old rival Stephen Douglas, Lincoln carries all but one free state enough to win the presidency with less than 40% of the popular vote. Even before Lincoln takes office, there is a push for Southern secession. Slave owners see him as the political equivalent of John Brown. The irony is that the president-elect believes the right to own slaves is protected under the Constitution. But six weeks after the election, South Carolina is the first to secede, and six more states soon follow. The Confederate States of America comes into existence with Jefferson Davis as its president, an army officer, veteran of the Mexican War. The time for compromise has now passed. It's very hard for a Southern politician to resist the force of secession, especially if you're as ambitious as Jefferson Davis was. This is a guy who thought he was gonna be president of the United States. The South is determined to maintain her position and make all who oppose her smell Southern powder and feel Southern steel. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs.
And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.